Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, the first podcast bringing the local fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I'm Joe Baia, and today I'm joined with Captain Richard Rutland. Captain Blood, what's up, Richard? Oh man, just happy to be here, uh, talk about some fishing. I think you had it right uh, when you said ugly. <laughs> <laughs> a little while ago, we're kind of on a little bit of a tough period here inshore, but uh, I look forward to get better here as we get off this full moon. Do you put most of it on that moon phase or is some of it on, we've had some, just some turbulent weather conditions and, you know, how much of it is moon and how much of it is kind of a transition? I think it's mostly moon phase. You know, the uh, earlier in the week, right on the moon, I caught some really nice size fish and you could tell that they were females and that they were already spawned out. You know, their bellies were, were fairly skinny and uh, you could see kind of the red marks around there on their bottom bottom end of their of the fish and you could tell they had spawned out already so i think they're kind of getting what i call the post full moon blues where they get a little bit lazy on you and uh you really got to work for them yeah they uh they need a cigarette i guess so (laughs) well uh let's get into this week's show sponsor this week uh it's uh your local geico insurance office everybody knows geico has great auto rates but did you know they also have great rates on boats atvs motorcycles and personal watercraft Give Ron Davis a call at 251-445-0053. Not only will Ron work hard to get you the lowest premium possible, but you'll have the service you expect. You can count on it if you ever need, God forbid, to make a claim. And guys, Geico does even more than insure your valuable items. This is something that that I didn't know about them, you know, early on. But uh, they also offer on-the-water services like towing, battery jumps, gas delivery, uh, and you can save by bundling these services with with your existing insurances, whether that's home, auto, anything that you've got. So, if guys, if you're an Alabama saltwater fisherman, listen to this podcast. Support the local insurance agent who helps bring it to you each week. Give Ron Davis a call at two five one four four five zero zero five three, or visit him online at geico.com slash mobile dash a l. Richard, tell me about the Wounded Warriors trip you guys put on. I, I, that's a really cool experience. I know I, I know. with your military exper- experience, you know, you were happy to, to get involved with that. But uh, tell me a little bit more about it and who all was involved and what y'all did. So to start off with, I had a guy um, named Derek Warfield who runs an organization called The Fallen Outdoors. And what he does is uh, – Puts together groups to go on hunting trips, fishing trips, uh, any kind of outdoor t- activity. He mainly does it here, you know, kind of kind of across the southeast. Anywho, it really started out as just he wanted to take a couple of guys fishing, you know, and reached out to about 10 different guides in our area. He said I was the only one that responded back to him. And I started asking questions and asking how many people he could possibly bring down and if I could put together a group deal. And one thing led to another, and I ended up with uh, – eight of us total to uh, run about 18 uh, veterans from our area. And uh, it really came together very nicely. So what guys were involved in it? Um, so we had Theo Atkinson, Bobby Everscotto, Patrick Garmison, Wesley Hallman, Ben Rains, And then I uh, had two, two recreational fishermen help me out too. We had Terry Turner and Joe Guile help us out so uh the uh, the state did something pretty cool they they put together a uh, kind of a uh permit if you will a uh, waiver to let some of these guys fish with the recreational guys and not have to buy a fishing license so that was really nice they really That's came awesome. together and helped out and then the jc's donated some uh some funds and put together a uh, fish fry for these guys after after we came in from a hot day of fishing got to sit underneath the awning at the rodeo site and enjoy some fried fish that's awesome. Well, congrats on putting that together and kudos on putting that to putting that together because that's uh, it's no small undertaking, I know, but I, I know those guys really appreciated it, and and I know you guys, uh, as all of us do, really appreciate their service. That we do, and they had a great time, and I'm gonna try to make it maybe a uh, a biannual event where I can have these guys down maybe twice a year, and we can do something like this because it was so easy to put together, and everybody's willing to pitch in and help as as they should. And yeah. uh, as as you would expect, and man, it was just great. Yeah, it's awesome. Those guys gave can give some time. I mean, this is peak season for them, so that's a big, you know, that's a big deal for them to give up a day of fishing and uh, and do that. 
That's just great to hear, man. Good job on that. Well, uh, let's get into our first report. We're going to take it offshore, talking with Captain Patrick Ivey, captain of the Breathe Easy, coming off of a really awesome tournament win. We're going to hear a little bit about some of that blue marlin fishing, some of that blue water fishing. Well, Captain Patrick, welcome back to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, man. I heard y'all had a uh, good weekend this past weekend. Tell us about it. We did. Thanks for having me. But yeah, we were fishing the uh, L.A. Billfish Classic out of Grand Isle, Louisiana, and uh, had a really good weekend. Went four for six on Blue Marlin and wound up finishing in second place uh, overall in second place tagging the least, but we're top money winners. So that's that's really where we want to win is in the checkbook. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, tell us about that fishing. I mean, you, was that day just a tag and release tournament? It was not. They had a kill in it, but it was a large kill, 112 inches. And the reason for that is over there in Grand Isle, they don't have a whole lot of facilities. If there were three, four, or five fish to be killed, they don't have the cooler space and things like that to keep them cold enough to donate to a food bank. So they right. up the size a little bit, which is which is great. That's perfectly understandable. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I mean, if, if you can ha- still have a good tournament with, with good prizes and good winnings and not have to kill, you know, game fish, that's, that's a win all the way around, I think. Tell us about the four for And they six. have an awesome facility over there. If anybody gets a chance to go to Hurricane Hole, it's a really nice place over there. Well, hopefully if they go, they won't go because of a hurricane. We, we just won't even mention that. Uh, yeah, it is quite quite a nice facility over there. The uh, So the four for six – was this all live baiting? It was. Um, we did live bait the whole time. I looked for the rip uh, around the Sam Croft and Medusa on Thursday afternoon, and it was gone. Uh, blended water, scattered grass, which has been absolutely brutal this year with grass. Uh, we've had days that were unfishable in places, and we would have to run to get out of it. But wound up uh, headed southwest from there and found a rig that found a rig that I thought looked like the right place and there were seven or eight boats there and saw several fish that afternoon feeding um and and hung out there and everybody else left and we made a trip out of it right there for two days we never left and got the bites we needed that's awesome so you know that that i'm sure that's a little bit nerve-wracking you know watching everybody off to greener pastures so to speak watch them leaving but you got it you just stuck to your guns you knew there was fish there and you felt like hey if we stick it out here We're going to make it happen. Right. You know, one of the biggest things for a fisherman is never leave fish to find fish. Yeah, I've heard that. That's that's the uh, that's the golden rule. I tell you, I can uh, I can relate from an inshore inshore side of things being a tournament guy, you know, and uh, myself. And it's definitely it's definitely nerve wracking to sit and wait some fish out sometimes. But I always say when it comes to tournament fishing, really just fishing in general, it's a feeling, you know, fishing's a feeling. You get a good feeling about a spot. You see the feed there. You see the, uh, yeah, you, know, you, you guys actually get to see the fish actually feeding and stuff like that. And man, you just got to sit there and wait them out and be patient, you know, and that's, uh, that's sometimes right. that's really tough. If you be a hero or a zero on that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> There's no doubt about it. That's for sure. So Patrick, when you when you're at this rig and you see these fish, what what are they doing when you see them? Are they coming up chasing bait? Uh, did you just see bait they showering? We they showered bait a few times, but we also saw, and that could have been the same fish a couple of times, but we saw three different fish. Uh, I know two of them were you know two different fish from the size of them, but we did actually see you know laid eyes on them, and I'm not sure what everybody else was looking at, but you see that you know, swimming around and chasing bait and things like that. It's just tough to leave. And and we decided to stick it out and everybody wound up leaving and it worked out perfect. Most of your bites, uh, when the bites come, they come early, late, all day long? They were scattered out. Um, The first day we caught a fish, first thing in the morning at 6.30. Then we caught the next one, I want to say around 1030 and then pulled another one off. I don't know. It was probably 330 in the afternoon. And then the very next morning, uh, Saturday morning, we caught a doubleheader at seven o'clock, uh, which was which was cool. That's only second doubleheader of Blue Marlins in the Gulf I've ever caught. And then we got another bite around 1030 again. And then shortly after that, it was, you know, about one o'clock. It was we had to head to the house. But uh, it just. Pay attention to your majors and your minors is, 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 a, is very important in fishing. Hey, uh, Patrick, uh, what what kind of focus does that take for you as a captain and your crew to, uh, I mean, 
you know, you thought you're talking about fishing almost three days and getting seven bites. What, what, what is that like? You know, the anticipation and kind of being sitting there ready and managing your, your lines and your baits and your tackle the entire time. You know, that's a good question. It's tough. It's not like trolling where you can kind of throw out, you know, throw your baits overboard and troll around and you don't really have to pay attention until you hear drag going off. My guys do a great job staying focused. If uh, I have three guys down there, three mates, um, and, and, you know, they, they're hands on a reel from daylight to dark, you know, holding the line, holding the reel, waiting for a bite. So they're, it's very involved. It's very time consuming catching bait and things like that. They never get to walk off the back deck, basically. Um, you know, just a lot different than the trolling. And maybe that's why some of the guys are not big live baiters, but. Um, it just works out better for us. We do a lot better. It pays better, better dividends for us when we get more bites. But they, they are very hands-on, very concentrated in the game, and they do a heck of a job with it. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I imagine it does take quite it, – it I imagine it can be really mentally draining. I mean, if, you've, if you're if you going four for six, I'm sure you're, you're pretty still pretty amped up from the last, last yeah, fish. But. Yeah, you get six bites in a weekend, Blue Marlin bites. That's a, I mean, that's a great weekend. I'd take oh, that yeah. every weekend without a doubt. You know, two weeks ago, or I guess it's been three weeks ago during the Cajun Canyon, we never had a bite in two and a half days. And that very mentally frustrating, you know, some days you just don't have the right stuff. Some days you do, but it's, it's, you, you, you got to always be prepared. We treat every bite, no matter if it's acting like a shark or whatnot, we treat every bite as if it's a blue marlin. But you go two and a half days without getting a bite, it, it, it'll wear on your psyche as a captain and a mate. You know, you're trying to figure out what we did wrong, why we didn't get bites, you know. Uh, it, that's a tough situation there. Well, congratulations on the, on the, uh, on the win. Uh, and I know that that's, uh, it's an exciting weekend. I've, I've only had one or two trips where we had that many Marlin, you know, in, in the baits. And it, it, those are really trips of trips of a lifetime for most people. But tell me about the, the meat fishing. It seemed like, the, from looking at the leaderboard, meat fishing's a little bit slow right now. It is. The tuna fishing's really, really tough not seeing very many tunas you know two of the four tournaments so far this year have had less than a 70 pound tuna fish win their tournament we had one that was this weekend was 70 pounds won the tuna fish and then a couple of weeks ago in venice louisiana the tuna capital of the world a 47 pounder won the tournament so tuna fishing's tough and that and a lot of that's got to do with the guys concentrating on blue marlin fishing a lot more but the wahoo fishing has been pretty good decent wahoos and the dolphin are they seem to be you know, here thicker than they have been in, you know, four or five years. And that's because of the grass. There is grass everywhere. I mean, it's unbelievable, choked out. You know, sometimes we can't even fish through the grass. We'll have to pick up and run to another rig or hold our, you know, hold our live baits in our hand, our line, and guide it around the grass. You know, keep it, not putting it in the rig or just keeping it off the rod tip off the transom. I got you. Hey, uh, Patrick, we're going to get a uh, tip from you this week. This uh, this week's offshore tip is brought to you by the Coastal Conservation Association. Come learn how to tag a fish with Tag Alabama Recreational Tagging Program, a partnership between the CCA Alabama, USA Marine Sciences, and the Dolphin Island Sea Lab that allows recreational anglers to participate in a fish tagging research study. The program is going to be on Wednesday, June 26th at Bass Pro Shops in Spanish Fort from 6.30 to 8. There's no cost to attend the seminar. It's open to all CCA members with an active membership. After you complete orientation class, you will receive a free tagging kit with tags for speckled trout and redfish. If you would like to attend, please send them an email at info at ccaalabama.org. If you're not able to make the start time of 6.30, they can accommodate late arrivals. I want to just say something about this uh, program. I've been participating. I kind of helped, I would say, pioneer it to a degree with uh, CCA and uh, USA Marine Sciences. And uh, we've learned a tremendous amount about our inshore fishery through, uh, through this tagging program. So I encourage anybody to uh, anybody and everybody to come out and learn how to tag. So pretty, pretty cool deal. It's kind of like my little hobby on the side, you know, when I'm, get, when I'm, when I'm guiding or, or fishing for fun. I, I always seeing how many tags I can get out in a day. It's a, it's, it's a fun little game. They've done a great job with that. It's from what I hear, the red fishing and trout fishing is at an all time high in Mobile Bay. And that's great that it's become that way. Well, we know how many uh, blue marlin tags you can get out in a day uh, or two. <laughs> but tell us, uh, tell us exactly how you do it, man. What are you thinking for an offshore tip this week? 
you know, we use uh, a couple of different sites, but Hilton's Real Time Navigator is a big key um, to a lot of these, a lot of us that do these offshore tournaments. Um, but it's key to our success. We, you know, get your subscription and learn how to read it. Look at the chlorophyll, look at the currents, look at the altimetry. Instead of just going out there blind, burning fuel, you know, you can you can get on Hilton's and find out where blue water is. Um, there's so many tools on this to use to your advantage. And network. Everybody networks. Everybody talks, and you know, gets tips or anything. But Hilton's will will really help you and point you in the right direction. Patrick, we've talked with a number of really good f- fishermen on this show, and and I consider you to be one of those as well. And one of the things that I've seen across the board uh, with everybody we've talked to is that whether it's mentally done or actually physically written down. These guys keep a log of when they're catching fish and the conditions in which they caught them, uh, and also when they're not. Uh, do you do anything like that? Is that is that a mental thing for you, or is that something where you actually keep track of? Hey, I, you know, we- I both. I do have a log book. Um, absolutely, I think anybody that really wants to be good at this should should do that, or 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 keep or or does keep track of what's going on, who caught what, where. And Hilton's actually has a new deal on their on their app to where you can put in fish and where they were caught and keep the conditions. It'll it's I can't exactly remember what it's called, but it's it, it gives you. I can go back on my Hilton's and mark where we caught fish and where everybody else caught fish this past weekend, and it'll show me the altimetry, the chlorophyll, this and that. So it'll it'll bookmark all that and show you and kind of does your homework for you. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, because that's the hardest part for me is like, I'll, I'll remember to write it down, but if you saw my desk, you'd be like, okay, which pile of papers is it in? You know? Right. <laughs> right. So and that, we're both captains, awesome. you know, we're not great uh, with our grammar and, and keeping track of things like that, but yeah, the Hilton's app and that's one of his new features that he did this year. And it's really awesome to see that's, that's funny you asked that question because that was one of the uh, a big thing that he come out with this year where you can actually put pins, what you call it, when you caught it, how, how you caught it, or who caught it, and pull up the actual conditions that day. Even next year, say right. for Emerald Coast, which is where we're at this weekend, I'll be able to pull up the conditions last year. Now, you have to go in there and physically put in the fish and, and things like that. Uh, he's not going to do all that for you. So you can set it up however you want, but it'll give you the conditions. You know, the conditions will always be there. That's awesome. I know I do that a lot uh, with my hunting. You know, uh, I try to keep track of trail camera photos and and then match those up to the weather conditions uh, when I got, you know, say daylight photos of mature whitetails. I try to right. match those things up. And, and you do start, if you do it long enough, uh, and you're diligent about it, you do start to notice patterns and absolutely you can come back to those patterns, those weather conditions, uh, atmospheric conditions and moon conditions. You can come back to those patterns regardless of the time of year. And I, and I've definitely seen an increase of success, uh, on the, on the hunting side of things from doing that. So I'm sure it's the same with, with fishing as well. Absolutely. Uh, Man, that is cool. Well, Patrick, man, as always, enjoyed having you on, and uh, congratulations again on the big win, and uh, thanks for sharing some of your insight with us. We'll look forward to having you on again. Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Hey, Joe, that was a great offshore report from Patrick Ivey there. Man, great tournament win, good stories coming from that from that tournament. Um, guess we'll bring up Captain Ugly, Patrick Garmison, with Ugly Fishing here to bring our uh, inshore report this week. Hey, buddy, how are you? What's up, guys? We need one more How Captain doing Patrick. Uh, we need an onshore Captain Patrick, and we can have <laughs> there all there you Captain go. Patrick's on here. The three Ps. I love it. <laughs> well, uh, What's before, up? before the show, Richard and I were doing a little talking, and, and he said it's a struggle fest right now. What are you seeing on the inshore side of things? Yeah, the struggle bus is is getting full. I mean, we're. I think it sounds like uh, everybody I'm talking to is kind of riding the same struggle bus so uh i don't know man i mean you're you're, we're getting some days we're getting some days where we're uh where the numbers might be there but the the, but the size isn't and 
nights and uh some days you may just pick up a handful of fish and and you get some nice quality out of it uh but it's been um kind of been that way for seems like maybe the last five or six days maybe going on seven days for me and that's fishing everywhere i fish the causeway i fish the delta i fish mobile river uh gilliard island uh western shore eastern shore dolphin island fort morgan i there's nothing just setting the world on fire right now well we've got some interesting conditions i saw the other night that uh the, the, a report for the one of the first jubilees of the year may be the first jubilee of the year and and I, I might be there. wrong on this, but that feels early to me. I was there. Uh, we we it was pretty interesting. We actually caught some really nice trout uh, at daylight. There were uh, there were birds working, uh, shrimp hopping. Some little like ten to thirteen inch trout were in amongst these shrimp. Uh, I mean everything. It was just like setting up just perfect over on the eastern shore. And then all of a sudden, I look around, I start seeing stingrays swimming around. And, I mean, we were catching fish, and then all of a sudden, we were not catching fish. And at like 8, 8.30 in the morning, it is a full-blown jubilee. Uh, I mean, and, and it affected everything that swims. We saw big, giant schools of redfish. We saw schools of trout. I saw sharks, stingrays, just shrimp. Everything that swims was was affected by that jubilee, and I man, I can't remember what day that was. Uh, maybe last Friday or something. And when that happens, everything in that area is not going to bite for at least a day, if not two days. Uh, so that that can really hurt the eastern shore side of things. Um, but usually, what happens is if 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 that wind direction switches which it has and we've gotten some south and west to the wind it'll it'll add a lot of oxygen to that water over there and things will start improving pretty quick as far as the uh, fish bite when i think jubilee i typically think middle of the summer really really hot i mean you know oppressively hot and when i'm thinking those conditions i'm starting to think about fishing at night uh around the dock lights uh have you yeah. guys heard any reports uh of that starting to kind of pick up or is that something to key I, in on right now yeah that definitely could be something to key in on i actually talked to uh trini woodham this morning at at the um at the bait shop and he said that he was down at dolphin island and uh was looking to do some gigging or something was wanting to show wanting to try to gig some flounder he said and uh he said that they were going by some dock lights and he said they were covered up with trout and redfish so it certainly sounds like uh if if you're not restricted to daytime fishing like Richard and I are, uh, and nighttime fishing is uh, something that you can do, it sounds like it would be definitely a good option for you. One, to beat the heat, and two, uh, it sounds like the fish are kind of congregating around those lights. Man, I really wish that I had time to go and do some nighttime fishing. I, uh, Captain Bobby gave me this book called Plugger about this guy from – been fishing like artificial lures for speckled trout since like the thirties. And, uh, he talks a lot in his book about catching fish at night, like not under lights, like go into a flat or go into an area that you would normally fish and fishing in the pitch black dark with lures and just absolutely wearing fish out. And I always wonder if that's what's going on during these periods, these moon periods where, where yeah. you know, they're, they're not feeding, they're not feeding during the day. You're just really, uh, either catching a bunch of undersized fish that are not of spawning size yet or, or, or spawning class, and then you'll catch these random, you know, bigger fish, it seems like, throughout the day, and it just seems like it's, it's just very inconsistent. you got to wonder if that's what's going on, if they're, they're flipping around and feeding at night instead of during the day. Who knows? I guarantee it. Uh, I mean, because there's not a lot of feeding going on in the day right now. Yeah. So when you guys, you see these kind of conditions like this, um, is it cause for despair or are you just looking at it going, all right, as soon as the moon, you know, kind of changes a little bit, we get out of this cycle, things ought to kind of pick back up. Is, it, is that what you think is going to happen? Well, I mean, oh, definitely. For yeah. me, I always feel like, I always feel like that every, every slump is, is rewarded with, with a, uh, you know, with some bounty behind it. 
so I'm I'm steadily looking for for any sign. You know, maybe the maybe the areas where where I was catching one or two fish or or five fish or something like that of of decent quality leading up to this to this uh, slump. Uh, those are some of the areas that I'm going to go back and and at least investigate. And uh, sometimes you find it that it just is on fire in those areas. So I'm optimistic that things improve pretty quickly. Well, we're talking, when you guys are talking slow, you're typically talking about speckled trout. But what about redfish? Um, guys, even, what about the, Dixie Barn? Even Bar? the redfish. What's going on with the bull reds? I, I haven't checked Dixie Bar in a while, but as far as just targeting slot redfish, even that's been a slow go. Uh, we're catch, we'll catch um, some of the areas where where I would expect to catch maybe eight redfish or ten or twelve on a when I drop the poles, uh, the power poles. Um, we're catching one, maybe two. So I mean, it's we're seeing a decline in everything that's you know as far as the the amount of bites you're getting. Yeah, the uh, something I've been doing to maybe combat just being a charter fisherman, you know, having to make the uh, make it make a day out of out of some bad, you know, a bad period of fishing. Uh, a lot of times during this kind of period, the redfish will save me, and I agree with what Patrick's saying. It's even hard to get bites from them right now. But uh, man, black fishing's been great. There's been a lot of black fish around there all the way up the bay. I caught some fish just south of Gilliard Island today, and I've even heard reports of them being north of Gilliard Island and uh man we just got l- lucky and ran across a uh a big rip today and I slowed down and idled and found uh four fish real quick you know and then heck it made the day we ended up catching two and seeing four and then uh ended up making the day I always try to kind of think outside the box when we hit these with the hit these tough periods with moon phase and whatnot think outside the box go go catch something else if they're not biting then oh. why beat your head against the wall Oh, you got that right. I will, I will do the same thing and try to take advantage of a triple tail or or even uh, some Spanish mackerel or something like that. Something that, you know, when you're when the day's done, you're like, man, you know what? We really didn't have a bad day. We just it it just wasn't it wasn't optimal for what I was wanting to do. But you know, switching gears can can help you out a lot. Richard, um, but one thing I was gonna say. Um, one of the better bites that I did get on uh, in the last couple of days um, was was after the tide had fell out a long ways. I had I put my wife on the boat. And we we hit a bunch of areas on the eastern shore that I'd been catching fish, and everything was zeroing. And I went to uh, a little bit deeper water around some docks as the water was falling out, and we found we ended up just after. Uh, working over several areas, we ended up finding a, a nice wad of redfish that were about 17 to 22 inches, and they were all up underneath the pier. Um, I mean, only one pier, though. I mean, we hit probably six or eight, and only one of them had any fish on it. So if you want to be hard-headed and keep working at it, You there, there's definitely some fish to be caught. Sounds like when you get in these slow times, and we've talked about that on past shows, slow times, it's it's a matter of persistence and, and, and capitalizing on the opportunities you get. That's the difference between having good days and mediocre days. And it doesn't take a whole lot of fish, like you're saying, Richard, to turn a, uh, a mediocre day into a good day. I want you to talk a little bit yep. more about that, that weed line fishing because a lot of guys uh, that have had experience with black fishing – are used to running structure, whether it's buoys or ship channel markers or even crab trap pots. I, I consider, you know, uh, crab trap buoys, I consider right. structure. But when you talk about fishing a rip like that or a tide line, talk to me a little bit about your strategy there. Uh, do you, you know, and, and really what I really want to focus in on is how do you approach those fish once you see them? Uh, like something I've talked about in the past, I always try to get the light uh, behind me, you know what I mean? Cause you, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of visual fishing, you're sight fishing. Mm-hmm. So I always get the light correct. You know what I mean? Whether, uh, whether I need to be looking to the left side, uh, when I'm moving down a rip or on the left on the right side, you know, either way, uh, to what, to what sets you up for the best. So sometimes you're sitting in the dirty water, looking into clean water. Sometimes you're in clean water, looking into dirty water, if that makes sense. And I start idling along. I literally uh, found rips and idled along them for hours. 
and uh, just found fish after fish after fish, you know, it makes for some really exciting times, but I'm looking for a lot of the, uh, the trash and stuff that's sitting in the rips, you know, you'll want to find like sticks and logs and five gallon buckets. If I find a five gallon bucket floating around out in Mobile Bay, I'm going to catch blackfish, if not two or three, most of the time. That's like, that's like, that's like finding a, uh, that's like finding what's at the end of a rainbow is a five gallon <laughs> bucket in the water. And, uh, but you know, you just want to ease along. Uh, you don't want to be going too fast. Cause man, before you know it, boom, they're right on top. You're right on top of a fish and running over him. So I'll get as high vantage po- as van- vantage point as I can, as far as, uh, getting up to be able to see idle along real nice and slow and then when you see a fish come to neutral i kill the engine uh get on my trolling motor and i really like to approach those fish uh in those tide lines with a free line you don't have any kind of a uh, vertical structure for them to wrap you up in or anything like that you can fish a much lighter drag use a uh just a spinning rod with about a two watt uh live bait hook and uh pitch a pitch a shrimp or something over to them is usually the best way, um, in my opinion, uh, to, uh, to to target those fish. So it's just take it take it nice and easy, and uh, get up high, and uh, just take your time and keep your eyes peeled. I like it. I've been doing a lot of this where I'm fishing shallow water, and I'm I actually just get up and stand on top of my console and drive the trolling motor. And uh, man, that that seemed that. That seems like that's added a couple of fish to my to uh, to my my day. So, have you ever done that? Is your console the size of where you can stand on top of it? Yep, I uh, I'll jump up on my console every once in a while. I don't have it. Feel like I'm standing on a two by six when I'm up there, like a single two by six, you know, uh, when I'm on my console. But I have a great vantage point from my uh, leaning post live well. It's about three foot off of the deck. I actually, I'll stand up on it a lot and uh, mm. kind of almost steer the boat a little bit up there with your foot if the water and the conditions are calm enough. And like I said, I mostly do that at idle speed, so try to try to be as safe as possible while you're out there doing that stuff. Well, but, well guys, this question would be for both of you then, and this is something that we've gotten a few times uh, questions to us, and we get boat questions from time to time. And one of the things that's become popular – uh, in the last decade or so are towers on bay boats. And we're starting to see, you know, like my dad's boat has a folding tower on it, but you see a lot of the half towers as well, you know, where you can jump up in that half tower and your feet are essentially at the at eye level uh, where you would be if you were uh, just working with a regular center console. So I know neither of you guys run half towers on your boat. Why, why, why don't you take advantage of, uh, of that? All right. My answer is I don't particularly like anything overhead. I mean, we already have, I do a lot of casting on my trips and the more, the the less things for customers to hit, the better for me. And that's just, that's my preference. I like as much space as I can for people to spread out and, and actually go through the motions of fishing. Um, go ahead, Richard. Uh, for me, I, I tend to agree with Patrick. I want nothing to do with a T top on one of my boats. I'm not a, it takes so much casting space away for me. And that's why I don't have one. Now I have, uh-huh. I'm actually in the process of ordering a new boat right now. And I'm going to, I'm going to price one out and see what one costs. You know what I mean? Cause they are very pricey on a boat, but I'm thinking about maybe just seeing if they'll build me one that's just straight up and down to where I don't have a, a like a top or anything off the back. And I, and I don't know, I'm trying to wrap my brain around that, whether that's going to work for me or not, but it's definitely be useful and definitely would, uh, I think definitely catch a lot more fish. If you're up there running around the bay or, uh, out in the Gulf or whatever you're doing, it's definitely going to equal more fish at the end of the day. Cause you're going to see a lot more things up there that you would normally see if you were down at, at, at water level, you know, you take yourself up five or six feet in the air which really your eyeballs are more like 12, 10 to 12 feet up in the air. Golly, you can see so much farther. You can see little patches of grass or a little bitty log that you might not have saw or uh, free swimming fish. These, 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 uh, these blackfish love to just lay on the surface and look like they're dead almost. And 
you're you're missing a lot of that when you're down at just water's level and i i would love to be up high but it's uh it's a trade-off everything about a boat's a trade-off you know you get one thing and you lose another every every way you look at it well and and the other part the other negative to it is this um when you get that tower and you'll love being up there you will like being up there and you'll want to start staying up there as much as you can um and you can fish from up there too so you know but like you're saying, Patrick, you do lose some of that casting ability for anybody that's not up there. The other problem, though, is that when you get it and you start to enjoy being up there, you're going to want to have all the same things that you've got at your at your helm up there as well. So you're going to want to have uh, a fish finding unit up there, uh, your GPS, everything else set up. So it's going to double the amount of electronics on your boat. And it, it, it like I say it's just trade offs, and you got to weigh that out. I think for the folks that are kind of wondering what they should do, is you got to weigh that out. I think for you guys, y'all are taking a number of people every single day, and I could I could see that for the average recreational guy, he's probably got enough room that he can afford to take up a little bit of room with the t top and and uh, and, and a tower if he wants one. So I will say this though, you can see a lot more blackfish. That's a fact. Man, I want yeah. one so I want one so bad, but it's just. Uh, it's just that trade-off, you know what I mean? Like I said, everybody wants everybody wants a bay boat that's going to run 65 miles an hour and <laughs> float in seven inches of water and have these <laughs> giant live wells. Yeah. And, uh, and stay know, be, dry in a four-foot chop. Yeah, and be able to go to right. 45 <laughs> miles offshore. I mean, that, that's what everybody's dream boat is. But the, it's just, it's you know, everything is a trade-off. You, you lose one thing, you get another. You get another, you lose the other. You know, it just... It, it just <laughs> I don't know. It's just boats. <laughs> there's, no, there's no such thing as the perfect boat if you like to fish for more than yeah, one. Thing. That's the, hey, no truer words have ever been spoken. Well, I want to ask both of you guys the Hey Cap question this week. It's brought to us by the Alabama Deep Sea Fishing Rodeo coming up July 19th through the 21st and the Roy Martin Young Anglers Tournament on July 13th. Uh, the rodeo open competition this year is $50 per angler, and there are additional jackpot competitions for Big Game, King Mackerel, Red Snapper, and Speckled Trout. Tickets are available online at fishingchaos.com and at the following retail outlets, Academy Sports and Outdoors, Blue Water Ship Stores, Greer's Market, Fowl River, Howell and Associates Insurance, J&M Tackle, Quince Hardware, Pronto Pond Theodore, and Tackle This, Shoot That. Richard, I know y'all got a cool event planned this year. You got some new things happening. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, hey, let me add one, one thing in there right quick while we're talking about rodeo something we need to get out to everybody is there will be no captain's meeting this year. Okay. There's not a captain's meeting. You don't have to come down there and sign out for big game, King mackerel, speckled trout, red snapper. It's all, it's all going to be, there's just no, there's no captain's meeting and then cash prizes and everything can be all done online uh, through fishingchaos.com. So there's, I'm excited about that. I think that's a really smart move on y'all's behalf because this is going to allow guys that are Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida uh, to fish in this tournament. And if they catch a nice fish, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it for them to go ahead and come on over, Uh, but they can fish. And if they don't, if, you know, if they don't catch something that they want to weigh in, they don't have to make that trip. So you're going to get a lot more attendance that way. And it kind of opens it up where it's in, in a way it's, you know, it's the whole Gulf now, really, if you want to look at it that way. It, That's right. Who's, who's king yeah. of the Gulf? I want to see it. Yep, I love it. <laughs> All right, boys. Well, this week, Brian Carson emailed us at Alabama at bestfishingreport.com. He says, hey, Cap, during the hot summer months, I struggle to catch trout later in the mornings and during the midday. What's the best way to keep catching a few more? Or should I just pull up on the sandbar, pop the umbrella and watch our sizzle videos <laughs> until the top water bite turns. Off. <laughs> <laughs> nice question, Brian. Oh man. I'm voting dar sizzle videos, but what do y'all think? Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with a dar sizzle video and a cold beer. If, uh, <laughs> uh, but seriously on, on, uh, increasing the trout bite during the day, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a switch towards trying to catch a big one. Uh, a lot of people don't. A lot of people think about big speck, daylight bite, sunset bite kind of thing. But I'm gonna. I will switch gears. Uh, and it and it actually worked for us at the uh, for the Florida Bama Rodeo. Uh, we caught some pogies 
and we started big fish fishing and we caught a six pound what 6.34 trout for the Floribama rodeo this uh this past father's day i had my son and my dad and we we caught one trout late uh mid or i guess midday uh and it was a uh it was a big trout my my son caught one a little over five pounds and um and that's the deal i always go i'll, I'll switch over go with some bigger bait slow my fishing down a little bit and um and just really key in on a big bite and if you know that that's what you're going to do you're going to probably not get many bites uh maybe not a single bite but i would do that and have something to hang your hat on for the end of your trip you got anything to add what about to that, you richard as as far as like you know from a charter fishing standpoint uh i'm not always thinking about catching a big fish i guess uh during that time of the day i'm usually thinking about maybe getting in some deep water over some rocks or around some structure something of that nature using a slip cork and using the tide and the wind to my advantage to do something like that. I, I know exactly what Patrick's talking about with catching a big fish throughout the middle of the day, because I feel like my partner and I in a lot of tournament situations have gotten some huge bites at that time of the day, you know, from that whole, like, you know, 10, 30, 11 o'clock till two or three in the afternoon, kind of, kind of period what a lot of people call like a dead period where you don't, have a ton of activity we have you know definitely cleaned up uh cleaned up and, and gotten some tournaments done doing exactly what he's talking about but I, i'm always going to retreat maybe to deeper water that time of that time of day try to find a fish that's not worn out by the heat uh if that makes a sense because the water temp- the water believe it or not the water temperature is getting on up there nowadays i think i was seeing in the mid uh like lower to middle 80s already it's it's hot already it's hard to believe it's that hot already but it's 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 here it's 86 degrees today it's all probably 84 85 it's it's definitely it's definitely hot water time well brian excellent question um i think both these guys are totally sandbagging just to stay in good uh good shape with their wives i vote for the dar sizzle videos so uh, i'm 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 a i'm a louisa fan (laughs) myself (laughs) that ooh, see i was gonna tag dar sizzle in this (laughs) and now i can't because you know now you're now you're talking about louisa so (laughs) well guys uh if you want to get your hate cap question in just email us at alabama at bestfishingreport.com uh and anyone who uh we select is going to be entered in to win the cca Alabama Sea Deck Fish Ruler that will be given away on July 4th. Hey, Cap questions get 10 entries, but you can also enter to win that uh, over on our Facebook page or at greatdaysoutdoors.com slash ASFR. Uh, totally free to enter, so you guys jump in on that. I'll tell, uh, I'll tell everybody, my, I've got my Sea Deck uh, measuring deal on my, on my deck of my boat, and I probably get more compliments on my measuring stick there that's uh the, my c deck measuring deal that the uh, cca does and any, anything else everybody's like man that is so cool and convenient and awesome you know that's a great prize to be getting yeah if we could just catch a fish to to measure on <laughs> well most of mine <laughs> my, most of mine have been measuring short lately so i don't know how much good it's doing me but anywho <laughs> right are you supposed to say no we don't need that thing man just throw it in the box it's good <laughs> hey patrick we appreciate the report this week man uh great great talking yeah. to you all right, guys, y'all have a good day. All right, Richard. Well, you guys focus mostly in shore fishing, uh, speckled trout, redfish, uh, but I know you do, uh, and triple tail, and you do a little bit of cobia fishing when they uh, start showing up and that gets hot. But our next contributor, man, he does a little bit of everything, but his thing that he sticks to is fishing from a kayak. So today on the show, we got Scott Kennedy with Whistling Waters Kayak and Charter. Scott, welcome back to the uh, show. Tell us a little bit about what's been going on on the on the kayak fishing front. What's up, guys? Well, uh, you know, the past week or two, uh, well, minus the past two days, we've had a lot of real, real calm weather, a lot of north wind days. So uh, we've been sneaking sneaking offshore, near shore with our kayaks a lot lately, um, you know, doing a lot of the trolling around for king mackerel and Spanish mackerel, and, um, you know, you get a lot of the bonita out there. And then, of course, you know, it's, it's snapper season, so we're, we're drifting out there and picking up some snapper as well. We've gotten a lot of questions about the, about offshore kayak fishing, 
recently, uh, and and a few questions with regards to bait. When you're going out offshore, I mean, you know, if you're going to bottom fish, obviously you can choose jigs and you can choose dead bait. But um, what do you do for live bait? What what do you like to do? Do you catch your bait out there uh, with sabikis? Uh, do you net up some bait right before you go? Uh, do you even worry with live bait? Um, yeah, live bait is key for kayaking offshore. Um, you know, usually I try to throw my cast net beforehand and get a hold of, you know, some live mullet or some live pinfish. But of course, you know, uh, you don't get those every time. Sometimes we have to, you know, use the sabiki rigs and sabiki rigs are usually pretty, pretty effective early in the mornings. Uh, you know, right around sunrise, you get those big schools of bait just off the beach and we can pick up some of that, but I guess my, my preferred bait to use though is, is a live mullet out there. Excellent. So talk to me a little bit about some of this near shore snapper fishing that you're able to access with a kayak. What, what type of structure are you guys fishing on? Is this public structure or private structure that you, uh, you know about, or are you just kind of drifting, um, natural bottom? What, what are you using no. to be in on? That's what, everything we're fishing is public numbers. Um, you know, of course we, we do a little bit of internet diving, try to try to find some numbers that are a little less than little less than known, but um, everything's public, and you know we just get out there, and of course you want a real calm day because getting out that far in a kayak can be can be a little dangerous if you have any storms pop up or anything, but we just get out there and we just start working these public numbers over, you know we'll hit one and. If it doesn't have any good quality fish on it, we'll just move to the next one and just move from, from spot to spot. It's a lot of, you know, a lot of kind of rocky bottoms. Um, you know, we are finding some tetrahedrons and, you know, some pyramids and stuff like that. But, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's all public numbers. So it's all out there on the internet for you if you want to get a hold of it. Hey, one Scott. Of- so uh, when you're talking about uh, paddling offshore, how, how far offshore do you think you guys are paddling? Um, you know, we go anywhere from two miles out to about the furthest we've been is four miles. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty neat, man. That's really cool that, uh, that you, you can, you can get off, you know, get that far offshore by, by paddle and, uh, and go, go catch some fish and come home and have, uh, completed an off, an offshore trip by, by kayak. That's, that's freaking cool, man. That's a lot of, not a lot of people can probably say that at this point, huh? Yeah. It's, it's always awesome to get back to the beach, you know, every, see it everybody's face when you pull up to the beach with some you know some pelagic species or the red snapper it's it's always a cool thing to see see people's reactions to it scott so, uh, uh, go ahead go ahead joe scott it seems like uh on public spots uh you know first of the season it can be pretty good and then as pressure has increased and and those spots have been fished what i've always seen is that you need to start scaling down your tackle and we, you know, I lighten up a lot of my term, lighten up a lot of my leaders, go to smaller hooks, really live bait starts to become more important. What are you seeing right now? Uh, when I'm talking about bottom fishing specifically, uh, when you're out on these numbers that are really close to shore, uh, and probably they're, you know, being public numbers are getting hit fairly, uh, fairly consistently. Do you see that need as well? Um, what kind of what kind of tackle setup are you using? Are you going down to some of the you know thirty pound leader and having to do that yet? Um, we hadn't actually had to start doing that yet. Um, you know, probably within another week or two of them getting hit, we'll probably start scaling down back to like you said, you know, some maybe some forty pound or some thirty pound. Right now, I'm still using a lot of fifty and sixty pound, and you know, we're still we're still getting plenty of fish to bite. Um, of course, you know most most of the big ones have already been either either caught and taken home or they're starting to get a little wise. So we're not seeing quite as many of the big ones as we did, you know, opening weekend. But, um, you know, we're still catching plenty of keeper size. What do you like to look for? You mentioned, you mentioned a calm day. If folks are thinking about trying, the, trying their hand at offshore kayak fishing, uh, what do you, when you say a calm day, mm-hmm. uh, is, is the – is the hardest part launching and then and then you know landing your kayak there in the surf? Um, or are you more worried about the storms and and things that could pop out pop up when you get offshore? Um, yeah, definitely. Getting getting off and on the beach is by far the toughest part. You know, dealing with the waves breaking and everything. But you know, if once you get past that, you kind of the the brakes start to turn into the rollers and you can ride them a little bit better. So those are. 
you know, once you get past that, that beach breaker, you're, you're usually fine. But, um, you know, of course you do always want to keep an eye on the storms too. So that's, that's a big thing. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't exactly run in real quick if you need to with these kayaks. So I usually try to look for like, you know, a North wind day. Um, you know, of course, look for, look for days when you have 0% chance of wind, uh, or I'm sorry, 0% chance of rain. Um, I, I don't like any kind of West wind seems like a West wind for whatever reason gets it real choppy right up against the beach. So any kind of North wind, uh, you know, a, a light East wind, uh, you know, less than 10 miles an hour kind of deal. Kind of what I like to look for. I tell you something I look for or, or something I notice and taken note of with, uh, watching the weather and being on the water every day is, uh, days when you look at, you look at the, the forecast for the day and you'll have, you know, some type, some type of north wind, you know, a light northeast, northwest, something like that. And then you'll see it go 180 degrees. It'll say like, okay, we're going to have a, uh, you know, three to eight mile uh, northeast wind in the morning, but coming southwest in the afternoon and staying light. You'll see days like that. It seems like it'll be a little bit breezy in the morning and they'll slick off and then be really calm for three or four hours. And then about two or three in the afternoon, that's when it kind of starts to, you get that, that sea breeze, you know, and uh, fishing with the weatherman, Jason Smith, every once in a while, he'll always say, you know, that's the, the, uh, the land heating and cooling is what will push and pull that air off of the water and give you those, those really nice clear days. That would be what I would be looking for is like when you get like a 180 degree change in the wind, you know, you know, you're going to have a slick period in the middle of the day. We can really get some stuff done. Oh yeah. And that's, you know, those, those slick periods are, are what we live for in the kayak. That's, uh, that's definitely the most prime time for us out there. Scott, I know you do, uh, you do the offshore kayaking, but you, you do more inshore kayak and what's the bite been like, uh, over in your neck of the woods, the guys over here, you know, we we're talking to Patrick and talking to Richard uh, throughout the show, and it's been slow um, as far as speckled trout and redfish goes. Um, what about on the kayak inside of things? Yeah, it's it's definitely been slower than it usually is this time of year. Um, you know, I've noticed we've been dealing with a lot of dirty water. It just seems like with all the the rain runoff and the the river runoffs we've had, just keeping keeping the water real dirty inside the bay, you know, not giving it a chance to clean up. You know, with that being said, there's there's still some fish to be caught, but you know, as compared to what we're used to this time of year, it's it's definitely a good bit slower. Man, that water quality thing was really starting to scare me a little bit. Uh down in the, you know, west part of the Mississippi Sound and in the bay and whatnot. And uh really this week is the first week I've seen a big turnaround, I feel like, uh water quality wise. So I think we've uh Hopefully got past some of that. We've got some monster tides this week. I think are going to clean things up a lot. I've seen a lot of nice clean water here in the past couple of days. Yeah, I think definitely the these tides we got around this full moon are, are definitely going to help things out a good bit. Big time. Scott, uh, what has been, uh, with the success you've been having uh, inshore, what, what's been the pattern that you see? Um, you know, we're fishing, you know, the, the top water bite right at sunrise has still been pretty productive. You know, it's, you can catch your, catch a few trout right at sunrise. Um, it's been dying down real, real fast though. So, you know, if I, if I'm fishing top water, I might do it for the first 30, 45 minutes of the day. And then I'm quickly moving to something subsurface, you know, been fishing a lot of, uh, you know, mirror dines. Uh, a lot of kind of x wraps, you know, just subsurface suspending twitch baits. And it seems like fishing those, uh, you know, a little slower, still giving it some good, you know, erratic motion, but giving it just as many, you know, long pauses, letting that bait really kind of sit there and hover. Uh, that's been real key for the trout. For the redfish, it's kind of similar. You know, we've just having to been slowing things down real, real slow and just picking areas over. And, you know, we might find a, a spot that looks pretty productive, like, you know, a creek mouth or something like that, and sit there and work that, that creek mouth over. And it may take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, but once you, you know, once you sit there and work it over enough and really, you know, really key in on that area, there's, there's usually some fish to be caught in it. All right, Scott. Well, sounds like a good, uh, a good report, really, overall. Uh, inshore seems a little slower, but sounds like the offshore deal, when you can find that window to get out, uh, is a really cool opportunity 
uh, with a kayak right now. And uh, I know you got a cool tip for us, a really smart tip this week. Uh, this really pertains to what's going on right now. So this week's onshore tip is brought to you by Alabama Marine Resources. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers who land red snapper in Alabama that one vessel report is to be submitted through the snapper check program before fish are brought on shore, regardless of where the fish were caught. Anglers can report their harvest online on the official Outdoor Alabama app, or on paper forms that select coastal public boat ramps. For more information about Snapper Check or the 2019 Red Snapper season, please visit OutdoorAlabama.com. So, Scott, I know you guys are like kind of over there, Florida, Bama line. You, you, you could be catching some of those fish in Florida, uh, but you got to check them in with Snapper Check. But even before you beat your kayak, man. So, I, ho- I hope you're doing it. Yep. Don't get, oh, yeah, uh, certainly. Don't get caught up yeah. over there, man. Well, tell us what uh, you got for the, uh, an onshore tip this week. Uh, for the onshore tip, I'd say, you know, last time I was on, I mentioned fishing bright and early, getting out as early as you can. Um, you know, this week, a lot of our best bites have been coming right around high tide. So it might not necessarily be as early as what, what we have been fishing, but fishing, you know, say you got four hours to fish, the first, you know, maybe the last two hours of the rising tide and the first two hours of the falling tide is a, uh, kind of been our our key time to focus on lately i like that high tide i just i just always like having something to focus on whether it's somebody telling me here's a spot to start out here's a here's a tide to look at i try not to be a spot fisherman but i'm just not as good as you guys to be able to really know uh go by the conditions and know what to look for and it's always good to have a starting point and and feel like you got a little bit of confidence going out and, and feel like you got a, uh, a direction to at least get started. So I like yeah, that. I, I, yeah, I can, I can definitely relate with that with the, you know, two hours ahead and behind a tide, whether it's low or high, you know, I, I, I like that area. I like, I like certain areas for that condition um, where, where you're going to get the water to slow down, you know, just fishing from the boat. I'm going to get areas where the water is going to slow down to a point, to, to a speed that you can a- actually fish it and it's not you're not having like this uh this ripping tide for you know three or four hours through an area where you can't you can't really pr- properly present a bait so it slows the water down around around high tide you know like you're two hours before two hours after i like that tip a lot all right scott well man we always enjoy having you on look forward to having you on again stay safe out there uh paddling your way around the gulf of mexico all right john we'll talk to you soon well, Richard, it was good having you on today, man. I uh, always enjoy co-hosting with you. Every week, we, we kind of have a theme to the show. What'd you, what'd you learn today? What'd you take away from today? Man, I tell you, uh, when we were talking to uh, Patrick Ivey fishing his tournament, his billfish tournament there that they did so well in, he was telling us how they, they pulled up to a spot the first day, and there was a lot of, lot of pressure, a lot of, lot of boats around. Uh, but they also saw a lot of sign. They they also saw a lot of the light, the, the right signs. You know, they saw like bait, plenty of bait. Saw some fish come up and and bill some bait or or uh, or chase some bait around and just got a real good feeling about the spot and laid with it and stuck with his gut reaction, which which to, to lay with it and see see what they could do in that spot. Spent two days there and. Um, had what six six shots at billfish man that's unbelievable you know in a in a weekend yeah six and, bites um, six bites and i think they said they had a seventh fish on a come hit a teaser yeah. yeah i mean that's just how how much better does it get but you know something i always tell people i say this all the time you know fishing is a feeling you know you get a funny feeling about a spot or something like that and right or wrong you i, I don't know I always trust I always trust what my gut tells me because uh I, it just, the more and more you fish, the more experience you get, the the more times it seems like it's right than wrong. And, uh, you, you know, you know, when you see the right conditions, when you see, uh, lots of bait on the bottom machine, or you see lots of mullet jumping or shrimp jumping around, uh, in an area, birds working, things like that. You, you, you really start to get a feel for things and you know, okay, man, this is, this is what it's supposed to look like. I'm going to fish this area. I'm going to get some confidence. And, uh, if it works out, it doesn't, and if it does, man, that's awesome. You, you, uh, you, you, you cemented that, that reaction. So trust your gut. I love it. Yeah. I, I like that. I, and I do think that was kind of a theme throughout the show was 
you know, we, we talk with Patrick Garmson and he says, middle of the day, you know, when it's hot, he doesn't feel like he's going to catch a bunch of fish. He's going somewhere where he knows there's a big fish and he's going to camp out there. And you said something basically alternate to that, but, but the same basic thing is that you're going to deep water when it's hot. And that's just a gut, that's a gut feeling, but you have that gut feeling from years and years of conscious and subconscious uh, evidence that, yeah. <laughs> that's come in, you know, and it's, um, it's funny how the mind works uh, on the, on the back end and the front end sometimes, you know, and gives you, gives you these ideas, yeah. uh, con- these conscious ideas sometimes to go do crazy things. And sometimes it works out. It's, it's, uh, it's you never know what it's going to give you. Yeah. It's cool. It's cool to have the logs and, and all the hard data where you can say, we caught them here on this day and this time and this, you know, moon phase and, all that. And I think that really helps me when I'm kind of at a loss, when I don't have that gut feeling anymore. And I'm like, all right, man, I don't, I got to go back to the drawing board here. But yeah, there's something to be said for just sticking to what feels right. And, yeah. Um, uh, back to what Patrick was talking about his, his end of the day, middle of the day, kind of big bites he gets. Golly, I can remember like uh, at least four tournaments off the top of my head where uh, Average Scott and I were battling it out trying to finish finish a tournament up and getting like a you know a six pound bite catching them at 11 12 o'clock in the in the you know in the morning or early afternoon or whatnot and just just from staying focused and fishing hard you know and uh and you just never you just never know when you can get a uh get a big bite like that you have to be you just have to really focus that was another question i asked patrick ivy about having to wait those wait those live bait fish out out there you know what i mean when you're just like you said his, his guys are sitting back there with their hands on the lines for you know sun up to sun down that's incredible it takes incredible most, concentration most guys are fishing recreationally and and i love it you know i love to go out and relax and have a good time work hard all week and get out there and just enjoy yourself no matter what happens and there's something to be said for that but there's also something to be said for fishing with a guy who fishes for a living and fishes competitively. And when you go out and fish with somebody like that, you can immediately tell they're on a different, they're just on a different wavelength. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, look at those trout busting over there and mm-hmm. drink another swig of beer. <laughs> and they're like, uh, uh-uh. you know, they're, they're catching them if they're seeing fish. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. And if you get the chance, you should definitely go fish with a guy who knows it, knows his game, especially if it's something that you're wanting to get into. And you can learn so much from just one day with a guy like that. And uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be tickled to go see, uh, to have been able to go see like what Patrick and them experienced over the weekend, you know, offshore sure. that I've never gotten to experience that. And that's something, something's always interested me a ton. So anyway, man, that's awesome. Well, man, I say I enjoy having you on folks. That's going to wrap it up this week. As always, we appreciate your reviews on iTunes. It, it fires us up. And we really appreciate you, uh, you jumping on there and leaving us a review and uh and subscribe in there if you haven't already if you'd like us to send you the show each week just head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com slash asfr and uh, we'll send you the new show by email each week uh it's gonna wrap it up y'all keep whacking them this week's saltwater fishing report is brought to you by angelo di paola the coastal connection with exp realty your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo D. Paola Realtor, The Coastal Connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440. And also, Killer Doc. Are you suffering from dock dysfunction? Check out a full line of dock enhancement at killerdoc.com. That's killerdoc.com. This is Captain Richard Rutland, and this report is brought to you by Cold-Blooded Fishing. You can find us at www.coldbloodedfishing.com. And also, Great Days Outdoors, the South's finest hunting and fishing magazine. Pick up your copy wherever magazines are sold or check them out at greatdaysoutdoors.com. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report was brought to you by me, Joe Baya, and National Land Realty. If I can help you in any way with the purchase or sale of land in Alabama or Florida, whether it's timberland, farmland, recreational land like hunting land, or even agricultural land or ranch land like sports farm, drop me a message at jbaya at nationallandland.com. That's J-B-A-Y-A at nationallandland.com. Also, Ugly Fishing Charters with Captain Patrick Garmison. You can check us out at uh, uglyfishing.com or call us at 251-747-1554.